HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Full send with the driver? Check. Piercing iron through the wind? Check. Low checker, high spinner, flop to a tight pin? Check, check, and check. No matter which shot you need to pull off, there's one ball that's better for them all. The all-new TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. With a newly redesigned dimple pattern, engineered for more distance, more control around the green, and better stability in the wind, it's the hottest tour ball in golf. So no matter what shot you face, there's one ball that's better for all. The TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to enjoy inclusion on the list of the best podcasts to listen to. Uh, We recently were added uh, or included, I should say, on the list of 12 small business podcasts to listen to if you want to increase your sales. Uh, It was originally on allbusiness.com and then Forbes.com picked it up, so pretty excited about that. And uh, getting on these lists uh, is really uh, happening because of the guests who join me. These are folks with expertise in certain areas of business. And they join me for a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you so you can get the answers you need and do better things in your business. My guest today is Damian Mason. Damian is a self-made businessman, agriculturalist, speaker, podcaster, author, consultant, and occasional TV news guest. He knows about starting a business from scratch because he chucked his normal job in 1994, creating a business of political comedy after winning a costume contest. Mason reinvented himself multiple times through successes and failures. He travels the world teaching people how to adapt their business for future success using real-world examples and lessons the audience can use. He is also the author of Do Business Better. Thanks so much for joining me today, Damien. Diane, thanks for having me on here. I really look forward to talking to your Accelerate Your Business podcast guests. Well, 
I appreciate having you here. We are going to be talking about the four traits of uh, entrepreneurship. And I want to start with something um, that you say that uh, success is a habit, but not a routine. And I'm wondering if you would share with the listeners what that means. Yeah, a habit is a active choice behavior pattern. It's something you actively do and it becomes something that you do on a regular basis or even a routine basis. You're saying, well, Damien, you just said the word routine in the definition of habit. I did, but a routine is defined as, a routine is defined as an unvarying, unimaginative rote procedure. Rote meaning without thought. So as I always point out to folks, do you want your tombstone to say she was very unimaginative, unvarying, and went through life without thought? That's what routine is. So in my book, I talk about 10 habits of success because these are things that we can do. We oftentimes think, Diane, of habits as being bad, you know, smoking or you know, picking your teeth yeah. or whatever that might be. But you know, there's also really good habits like flossing, exercising. Those are habits. Those are active choices that you, you don't just fall into this routine unvaryingly and unimaginatively and without thought. You actively say, I'm going to floss. I'm going to be physically fit. I'm going to make 10 sales calls today. I am going to reach out to three new prospective customers this week. I am going to invest 20 more dollars per day uh, in this uh you know, future fund that I want to fund my, uh, my retirement. Those are active choices. Those are habits. Those are not routine. So I think what happens to folks, and one reason that we aren't as successful as we could be, is we just start not thinking. Uh, you know, there's a guy that does uh, motivational speaking. He's got a book out. And he's one of these ex-military guys, and, and it's fine. I'm not bashing on him, but I saw one of his points was that you should wake up early and just not think. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Not think. <laughs> I mean, have you have you attributed any of your uh, success, Diane, to not thinking the consulting that you do yeah. with your, your <laughs> small business owners? Hey, just don't think. Uh, no, I don't think I'd get very far if that was my mode. Yeah, if that, or if that was your advice to the people that hire you as a business Ugh, consultant, they yeah. you know, they've got seven dry cleaners, and you say, "Hey, just don't think." Well. <laughs> I get it. There's a time to put your head down and work, but even when you're putting your head down working, you should still be thinking about what the future, uh, you know, endeavor is and what you might do to be more uh, in demand next year. Right. Right. Wow. That's weird. I, I hadn't heard that one and, and I, I get it. And I thank you so much for that explanation. Cause what's funny is when I said the word routine, I sort of felt like that, wrote it's just something you do you don't think about it it's not tethered to anything it's just sort of mindless so have you, have you ever noticed diane that a lot of times when we describe somebody that never varies we say oh he is a creature of habit oh uh, he just is habitual no 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 no. habitual is of course bad you know uh you know drugs or whatever but creature of habit really is not what is not the right definition because that means they don't think, they don't change, they don't vary. Again, that's the definition of routine. Habit, I'll give you a great example. Uh, a habit doesn't kill you nor make you successful in the first day, right? I mean, you smoke a cigarette tomorrow, it's not going to kill you. If you smoke three packs a day for the next 50 years, it'll probably kill you. So there is absolutely this thing about the compounding interest effect of habits. If I just challenge myself to, as a habit, every day make one new sales call to a prospect, that habit over long periods of time will pay off. Again, just like saving money is a habit. You know what? I'm going to forego the Starbucks today, and I'm going to put that $4.50 into savings. You're saying, what's $4.50? Well, it's about, it's about 30 bucks uh, you know, per week. And then uh, 30 bucks per week becomes $1,500 over the year and, and that habit of saving. So the same thing about bad habits. You know, a bad habit over time just absolutely wounds you and it makes you not successful. I think this is so, I'm so glad that you just said that because um, I love that concept of, you know, a habit doesn't make you successful in the first day because it's really the point right? This is something you just commit to and you do. And it's not, I mean, what I heard you say was even if you committed to making, doing one 
new outreach a day. It's not like you're saying you have to do something that's really a massive endeavor, that, that's really a huge effort. It's, it's just, it, it can be as simple as one thing just yeah. every day. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine that's an entrepreneur, he started like 16 companies. He's been a guest on my own podcast. He's a sharp dude. He's, he says something that's pretty smart. He said, you know, people get overwhelmed with the uh, big changes, big initiatives, because let's face it, it's the old thing about how do you eat an elephant? So he says, well, just say you wanted to make a huge change uh, in the year 2019. Well, break your year into parts and you say, all right, what if I just made a 2%, a 2% variation and a 2% progress every week at the end of the year, after 50 weeks, I've done a 100% turnabout, you know, and that's kind of like the way you should look at the habit thing. Uh, again, a bad habit, a bad habit ain't going to kill you tomorrow. Uh, a bad habit will kill you over a long, long time. And I'm talking about sales and business. You know, we've got your salespeople on here, but let's also talk about, you know, it can relate to anybody. I started out in political comedy, Diane. In 1994, I returned to my resignation from corporate America. I was a sales rep, so I completely understand your listeners that are salespeople. And I was fine. I was good at it. it, it I understand all those things. But I wanted to be rewarded for my own creativity. And I wanted my compensation to be based on my work, not based on whether a, a, you know, a regional manager thought that it was time for my promotion. So creativity and compensation was my goal. And one thing about starting out in political comedy, it forced me to write material. And so again, you talk about a habit. Now, while they talk about in comedy having a routine, again, think about that. What that routine really means is you get up and you deliver it. And bad old club acts get up and they do the same exact shtick. And it don't matter whether there's a group of kindergartners in the comedy club that night or a group of senior citizens or a group of salespeople, they pretty much do the same thing. I always think it's kind of insulting to say you're doing a routine. I say, I'm doing an act, I'm doing a show, but that's not necessarily a routine because I'm going to vary it based on my audience. And then again, talking about habits, one great habit that I have was I created content every week. And that's, that's kind of like the sales thing. Every week, create new content, create new material, try it out. It may not hit, but by God, you habitually, actively make new material each week as a habit. Yep. And you're really just honing your craft, right? You can't just say, well, I know how to do this thing. And so therefore I, I'm going to take, if it worked, I'm just going to keep repeating it because then you're not really growing with it and being able to do more and better. Well, of course, uh, over time, your material is going to start to be dated and uh, the stuff that works yeah. is going to get stolen from you. I mean, this goes on and on and on. So habitually, yeah. you should always be cranking out new stuff. You know, you and I both advise, consult, speak, train, whatever you want to call it. Um, while I have a lot of fundamentals that I can teach people, I also know that I've got to keep delivering it with a current twist so that the folks can understand that, uh, you know, one of my big points I make is business plans. I don't believe in them. It's fine to have some plans. It's fine to think about your business. But this idea that you're going to map out is, again, yeah. routine, routine behavior, Diane. I'm going to map out on this document what I want to do over the next 10 years. Well, who in the hell can predict what the marketplace is going to look like 10 years, even five years from now? You know, uh, did, Uber yep. exist? did Uber exist five years ago? Not really. So think about the changes. So I always say, again, that's routine. And that is commodity mindset. And that is the reason that folks resist change. It's all the same thing. Whereas as a habit, you say, I'm going to attempt one new endeavor each week. I'm going to, whatever, I'm going to roll out one new product each quarter. You know, there's a lot of ways we can extrapolate this to your listeners. As a habit, right. as, a habit as an active behavior, I'm going to move where I work each quarter six months because I don't want to get too stagnant. There's all these kinds of things that really are about making conscious choices of how you go about things. Yeah. And I totally agree with you about the whole business plan. It's funny when people ask me what I do and I, I tell them what I do and I say, um, I will do business planning with anybody. I do not create business plans to get funding because it, it, they make no sense to me. I mean, I get it when you need it for funding, if you're going to go after it, but uh, on a, for an average business owner, they thinking that far out is just 
sort of silly. Like I- I'm happy if they think a year out and then they back it up to, okay, what do I need to do right now? And, but you got to be flexible with it. It, you know, things could change. You got to yeah. be paying attention to it. So yeah, I, I totally get that. One of my things I always say, Diane, and it's in my book, Do Business Better, which I do hope your listeners consider picking up in audio or Kindle or hardback form off of Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. But one of the points that I make, and I make it just as regularly as possible when folks say, well, because I went to, that's how this whole thing came about, was that I went to an entrepreneur class as a guest lecturer and the students all asked me what it took to be successful running one's own business. And they asked me about entrepreneurialism. I said, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur, but I don't know. There's people that make me look like, you know, a, a timid little kid because they start businesses left and right. I've, I've been on my own for 25 years. There's certainly a lot of pride there, but there's people that have accomplished more and that's fine. But I said, uh, here's the thing, students. You tell me what it takes to be successful. Then I'll tell you what I think. Because I'm the one that's been out here doing it for a long time. And each of them went around the room and, and said, you had to have a really good, well-written business plan. You had to have a really good business plan, a very solid business plan. And then they asked me what I thought. And I said, I've never had one. Um, I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, they're unvarying. Again, the routine, they don't, they don't vary. And all of a sudden, we're going to do this. And in five years, this. And in seven years. And in 10 years. And all of a sudden, the whole world turns upside down and you're telling me that, that what you wrote down nine years ago, also they become almost like religious documents because they spent so much time putting into this business plan, Diane, they're reluctant to vary from it because it's very dogmatic. And you and I both know adaptation to what's going on in the marketplace is a lot of one's success. And then my other thing about uh, business plans that I always point out is, your bank, your lender will probably require it. You just talked about working with your clients and helping them get funding. Okay, there's going to be a bunch of folks that say, bring me your business plan. You know why? They've been asking for that for 150 years. You right. need a business plan to borrow money. You do not need a business plan to make money. Right. Yeah, I'm really glad that you um, said this because I it, it's, I And I'm really, I was funny because I was going to ask you what you thought about uh, people writing that business plan and then feeling like they have to stick to it. And so then when things change and they aren't good at adapting, things don't go quite well. And then sometimes I think they feel like they're a failure if they don't continue to go down that road, even though it was sort of silly to think you were going to be able to go down a very specific road over a long period of time. All right. So everybody listening to the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast wants to do really well. I mean, they, they're, they're mindful sure. to what they're doing and they're right now saying, man, I, I really, my, my lender and, and my, my, un, my entrepreneur advisor, my business coach told me <laughs> I had to have a business plan. No, it's a bunch of bull hockey. Here, here's the thing. Again, they are comfortable for people that have traditional jobs because now they have a script to follow. And I'm more of a improvisational guy. I don't, I have a script. Certainly I have a routine. I, I work when I get up in speech, do speeches. I use a keyword outline, meaning I have the word China and I know what I'm going to talk about, about China. I have the word uh, evil Knievel. And I know I'm going to talk about risk tolerance right there. In other words, I can go off script because I don't even have one. And business plans become scripts because the average person is afraid they're going to have to freewheel and they're afraid they're going to have to actually pivot and move and, and think on their feet and all those kinds of things. And that's what business is. Again, you tell me that the marketplace five years from now is predictable. It is not. It is not predictable one year from now, probably not even one month from now, because there's going to always be some new thing that pops up. Right. Absolutely. So you get married okay. to your business, you know, Diane, you get married to your business plan. And then all of a sudden three years from now, you say, well, I'm sticking to the plan. There's one thing to be said for not being all willy nilly. Oh gosh, we ran into this obstacle. So yeah. tomorrow we change gears. Oh, you know what? We ran into this, this challenge and now we're going to change gears. You don't change every single day what your direction is. You simply don't also get married to a document that tells you what you're going to do nine years from now. Exactly. That's right. It's a living process. So tell me, I think a lot of people, I mean, I know, a lot of people think about starting their own business, but they don't. So what do you think it is that holds them back? Well, the easy answer, of course, is fear. 
but uh, you could be mean and, and say, well, it's laziness. <laughs> so, <laughs> what is it? I mean, because really, what is it going to be? And then it's excuses also. So where is that? That's somewhere between fear and excuse. I mean, you don't just make up an excuse because you felt like you had to make up an excuse that day. It's covering another reason. So what's your real reason? Is it fear or is it laziness or is it risk tolerance? I mean, there's one of those things, but again, fear and risk tolerance kind of go hand in hand. So the reality is, the reality is folks are doing what they want to do. It's one of my favorite sayings. Everybody tells you, you know what I'd like to be doing. You know what I really want to do. I say, yeah, I do know what you really want to do. You're doing it. <laughs> huh? No, no. What I, I love is, that. Wait a minute. Yeah. Said, if you really wanted to do it, by God, you'd be doing it. So that's really as simple as I can make it. When people say, you know what I really want to do. I want to have a business. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, wh why aren't you? Well, you know, and I got kids and, and, uh, and, and of course right now, I mean, things are so busy with my work and I haven't, well, <laughs> okay. I'll give you a one week. I'll give you one month. I'll give you a quarter. I'll even give you this year, but you know what? Everybody's going to do something. Ask them when. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, oh, that's so interesting. So it's the difference between uh, a wish and a plan, right? You got, you got to, you got to put the stake in the ground. It's usually more about doing it. It's more about action. You, you know, yeah. when everybody says they're going to do something and I want to start this business, I say, great, do it. Well, I've got to get some things like that. Well, you know, and it probably happens to you as well because people want me to give them advice and I have advised people. I don't do take you out for lunch or buy you a cup of coffee and pick your brain stuff anymore. That used to be the deal years ago. Everybody wanted to pick my brain. I said, you know what? When, when there's roadkill, there's like a, a turkey buzzard picking its brain. I don't want my brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't drink coffee either, but people always want me to tell them how to run their business. And I say, a lot of this comes down to just doing it. A lot of this comes down to you just starting it and going. Uh, you can make up all the excuses in the world that you need to get the funding and you need to get this thing in place. And then what's funny is they always then say, well, no, like what about the legal structure? Now, do I need to be a 5013C or an LLC? I'm like, you don't even have a product. You don't even, you don't even, have, a, you, you don't even have a customer. What the hell are you worried about what your business structure is right now? When you actually have, when you, when you have something in motion, then we'll worry about it. That, that's, a, that's an hour at the attorney's office. Uh, you're using that as an excuse. What are you doing? Uh, what's your business? Who are you going to serve? What's the clientele? How are you going to reach those clientele? Uh, how are you going to produce this product, good or service? You know what I'm saying? And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. So what holds them back? You can say it's overwhelming. That it's, it's really daunting. It's mostly action. It's mostly that I think that they, yeah. they talk about what they want to do because they can get credit that way. Oh, Diane, yeah. you know want to do? And of course, your answer cannot be the same thing as Damian Mason. When they tell me what they really want to do, I say, yeah, I do know what you want to do. You're doing <laughs> And I can't wait to use that, which will probably happen sooner rather than later. Give me credit, please. <laughs> oh, I will. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break, and then I want to continue the conversation. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Do Business Better by our guest, Damian Mason, and Breathe to Succeed by Sandy Abrams. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we are speaking with uh, Damian Mason about four traits of entrepreneurial success. Damian, uh, you say that people have a business personality. Can you explain that please? I can. Uh, everybody, you know, you have a personality and you have a business personality. We all know that we have variations and that's what makes us human and that's what makes this whole thing fun. I'm different than my wife uh, in, in many ways. 
because of her personality and my personality. That's fine. Well, if you want to be in business, like the folks listening to the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast want to be in business or are in business or own their business or aspire to own their own business or are in sales, driving business forward, they probably need to understand their business personality. And if they're a certain degree of success uh, in their career, they already do understand their business personality to a certain degree. I call it the five P's. And the five P's are, are you a product person? Are you a process person? Are you a people person, a promotion person, or a profitable person? Now, you and I both know that you better have the number five dialed in if you're going to be in business. You better understand the money. I find it very interesting. You have this too, I'm sure. You know what, Damien? I really want to be uh, in business. I've got this great idea. And, and I say, okay, okay, okay. Now let's talk about what the, the cost of entry is going to be and, and how much you're prepared to invest before you start making money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to tell you about my idea. I'm like, I love your idea. It's amazing. It's the best idea I've ever heard in my entire 50 year life. Now then let's talk about the money. Well, I don't really, I don't really, I don't really have any money to spend and I can't go without an income because you know, I don't really have any savings backed up and, uh, and, and I don't really even like to think about money. You should keep your normal job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's what I have to advise people on. And the profitable part is critical because you are in business and you can say, well, I'm not really, uh, you know, greedy. No, no, no. I don't care about any of that. You can't help right. yourself, feed your family, or even give your money to charity if you don't first have a handle on the money. So make sure that your business personality possesses the profitability aspect of it. Then from the other standpoint, product, process, people, promotion. You're probably really, really good at one of those. You're probably decently good at two of them. You're not going to be good at all four of them. You just aren't. I, for instance, am not a process person. I worked in a ceiling tile factory. I think it's amazing how we made stuff. At one end of the factory, a pile of rocks came in, and at the other end of the factory, a box of ceiling tiles went out. It was amazing. But being the engineer that had to decide how to shave an eighth of a penny of production cost off of that ceiling tile would drive me bananas. So process people tend to not be creatives. They tend to be engineer types. No offense to engineers, we need them, but that's a process minded right. person. I used to work with an agent and he would always say, oh, I'm very detail oriented. He'd just get in my hair. I'd be working over here on a creative thing about a show for a client. And all of a sudden he'd start saying stuff like, well now, are we gonna use number two pencils? We're gonna, it's just that kind of stuff. It's like, I don't know, but you just took me out of my zone, man. So that's process people. Yeah. Then of course there's product people. I'm pretty good at the product. I write books. I'm a farm guy. I like creating stuff. I own a farm. I like, right now there's hay being made out here on my farm. I like product. I like production. And so some people though get too caught up in what their product is and they think it's all that matters. And you and I both know there's lots of average products that become very successful. As I always point out, that whole thing about build a better mousetrap and, and the world will be, that's a bunch of crap. There's a bunch of mediocre mousetraps that are making millions of dollars and there's probably a brilliant, amazing mousetrap that never left the lab because the person had no idea how to fund it, how to promote it, how to talk to people to get it out there. Product, process, people. I'm an average to below average people person. I'm actually kind of an introvert. People say, you got a comedy background. Yeah, a lot of comedians are pretty introverted. They're actually misanthropic. Uh, I, I'm not a great people person also because I'm too honest. I wrote a book called Brutal Truth. Some people don't like it. Do I look fat in these pants? Yes. Well, why'd you say that? I hurt my feelings. Well, why'd you ask? I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> do you think I'm making a dumb decision? Yes. Oh, well, why'd you ask? Right. Uh, so I'm not a great people person. And then, of course, there's promotion. I'm a pretty good promotion guy. I used to be in sales. You're probably a pretty good promoter because you understand the need for it to be successful. The world doesn't know about right. your mousetrap until you promote it. The world just lost a great promoter last week, Lee Iacocca. I use yeah. him as a reference in my book, Do Business Better. And the reason I reference Lee Iacocca is he gave himself credit for creating the Ford Mustang. He created the Ford Mustang as much as you and I did. Uh, uh. <laughs> but, he, but he gave himself credit for it because he was running, uh, he was running yeah. Ford for a while, uh, right. a brief while. And uh, the engineers that created the Ford Mustang, he gives himself credit for saving Chrysler. Now, he was the front man, and he was the CEO for Chrysler, but Chrysler was bailed out by the taxpayers of the United States of America. You know what yeah. he did to save Chrysler? 
He went on commercials for 18 years and he convinced Americans to believe in America. And part of that meant believe in Chrysler and Dodge and buy that minivan. He convinced Americans to buy those minivans. So did he say Chrysler? Kind of, sort of. The taxpayers did but he promoted the hell out of himself and out of Chrysler. And he was a promoter. He had his own book long before Jack Welch and these celebrity CEOs. There was Lee Iacocca. So there's a big value of promotion. If you're going to be in business, you probably need to have the promotion gene. If you don't have it because you're over here hung up on the process, make darn sure you have a promoter on your staff that every day is out there trying to sell those minivans or widgets or whatever. So this is, uh, thank you. Uh, I I, I love this, and I, um, I'm really glad that you said if you aren't one, make sure you have one on your staff, because I think a lot of people get hung up thinking they have to be, you know, be able to do all of these things, and then that's a struggle as well, because if you're not good at it or it's an uncomfortable thing, you're not going to do it well, so you're not helping your business. Yeah, and again, your, your business is not known. Uh, believe it or not. So if your business personality tilts toward, I'm a, I'm a people person. I just want to help people. Remember, people, 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 persons get taken advantage of sometimes. Like they just can't understand why this customer wouldn't pay their bill. Why, you know, I, I thought that she was a good person. Well, because a lot of people are not good persons. So when you're a people person, you better have somebody on your staff that is the other things, especially the profitability. Uh, if you're a process person, again, you're going to be so hung up with how something gets done or one, how your service works that you're going to always talk to your customers about your brilliance of your process. And the reality is your customer probably doesn't give a damn. Your customer cares yeah, about themselves. Yeah. Your customer wants the result. They don't care about your process. Processors are right. terrible salespeople because they're over here hung up about how something happens, which manila folder we use and blah, blah, blah. Customer doesn't care. Right. Right. Gosh, so true. So um, another thing that I find, uh, especially in the, the, you know, we're in such a fast paced, uh, changing world uh, that I find uh, people struggling with is staying relevant. So what advice would you give to listeners if they're thinking to themselves? Yeah, that's something I'm struggling with. How do, how do I stay relevant? How do I keep my company relevant? Yeah, we all struggle with that. Once you have uh, any modicum of success, you're going to get copied. That's the way this thing works. The uninnovative, the uncreative only know one way to go to market, to copy what they see working in the marketplace and then sell it cheaper. Uh, so you need to be in front of that. Either you can be a copycat and sell it cheaper and eventually it gets to where there's no margin because it's all been stolen. Or you can be uh, an innovator be relevant. And I went through this a lot. You know, I was a political comedian. I did pretty darn well. And then the world changed on me pretty quickly. And I thought, okay, I'll just take a year and retool. And it took me five years. That was the most humbling and biggest setback that you could ever imagine. And also it was extremely educational. That's the benefit of, of, uh, of going through harsh setbacks is you realize, wow, next time I'm not going to wait until I'm pushed in a corner with a gun to my head to try and re reinvent. I'm going to reinvent before it becomes a necessity. So what you probably need to do and your listeners need to do is always be thinking, where's the marketplace tomorrow? It's funny. They always think, well, what's our competitor doing? What's your competitor doing? Who cares what your, comp your competitor is probably doing what you're doing. Yeah. What can you do to fill tomorrow's marketplace? So relevance is always about listening. In my opinion, the best trait I ever came up with because of being, uh, you know, funny is observe, 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 observe. And so I make some pretty bold predictions that people think are crazy. And it's funny, my wife just the other day, she said, you know, Damien, you're always a few years ahead. You know, maybe we don't, uh, we don't like, we're not out here as futurists or we're not out here, you know, flying around spaceships. You always say, you know, what's going to happen in a few years. This is finally going to catch on. And so it's about paying attention to the marketplace and more importantly, what people's wants are. Uh, you know, like I see the sharing economy right now, Airbnb, then Uber, and then just an article in the, you know, I just shared the other day throughout all my social media was about housing reinvented. So in these larger cities where there's uh, younger folks that don't make a lot of money, they already are used to sharing everything. I mean, communism is not much of a stretch for these kids. They, they don't have yeah. a car. They share people's houses. 
So now it's group housing where they basically have a bunk. It looks like an old bunk house at the YMCA. I believe this is going to catch on because you have a whole bunch of uh, younger folks that think this is natural. I wouldn't do it. I don't like having, I don't like having people close to me, <laughs> but, but, but relevance really is about looking at something and saying, is this a flash in the pan or is this a trend? And it can't just be from one thing. It's from a multitude of sources. So one way I stay relevant is I keep up. I read the Wall Street Journal, but I also watch different TV news. And I also read about five different articles from different sources every day. That's how I help stay relevant. And I try and connect the dots. So I, this is I especially love the paying attention and listening and watching what's going on and seeing what people need and, and want. Um, and I think that that really is a big thing in this uh, time when things are changing. One of the things that I feel like I'm hearing you say is uh, you can't only think about things in terms of what you would want or what you think would be comfortable. You have to really be able to look at, okay, but what is happening out there? Yeah, because what's happening out there is what your future is based on. Again, so many folks, because it's easy. And again, they're not creative and they are, they're not driven. They're not motivated. So they just watch out what the name, what's, what's going on? What's the competitor doing? What's somebody else doing? What's somebody else doing? And then they're always reacting and they're reacting to what worked yesterday. Uh, Long term, yeah. you know, look at what's going to work tomorrow. And you don't know that for sure. But if you are an observer, you can already see where the folks are heading. As I point out all the time, that old thing about run when everybody's walking and walk when everybody's running, that's an old statement that most people don't know. My wife and I have made money on real estate because when everybody says, oh, you got to go out and buy, you got to go out and buy. It's good. I'm like, yeah, I'll wait until everybody's telling me to sell, then I'll buy. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really about <laughs> observing. So that's, that's to me observing because most folks, there is a real thing called herd mentality. So yeah. you're relevant. You can either just be part of the herd or you can either be at, you can be at the front of the herd or you can run counter to the herd. Yep. Love it. All right. Talk to me some about emotion because this is another thing that I find, um, uh, you know, business owners especially struggle with. They're so emotional about their business on so many different levels that I, it feels like it prevents them from, I'll say thinking clearly. Sure. So, well, first off, humans are emotional beings. We're not logical beings. I tend to be more logical. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm on the verge of being autistic in that regard. Again, I, I'm very much like uh, non-emotional about certain things, and I'm very straightforward about this, and that's to, in no way picking on autistic uh, folks. I'm just saying that there's, I have that side of me. Uh, I'm not as emotional as many. I have a hot temper because I'm very driven, but I don't have this extreme emotion. You see people, Diane, that, that just – Every single thing, like what uh, shirt to wear. Uh, I don't know if I can tell him I can't come to his child's birthday party. I mean, if you just live with this much emotion and sh it's just draining. If you know it's draining to be around folks that are just at heightened states of emotion over every single thing. Did I use a blue point, blue ink pen or a black ink pen? And the emotion goes along with that. So I don't know that we, any of us do ourselves any good to be that person or be around that person, but we can admit that as humans, we are emotional more than logical oftentimes. And it's good to be emotional about your business, but you cannot run your business emotionally because emotions are not logical. So emotions tell you to do stuff you shouldn't do. Emotions scare you. Emotion, you know, what? mad, sad, glad, fear. Those are your four basic human emotions. Are you going to do yourself any good by being fearful? Maybe, yeah, you know, protect your business. Being mad, what the hell is that going to do for you? You know, sad all the time? Well, you're sad when you have a bad day, but you need to run your business that way. And glad, well, yeah, I mean, I get glad. I was in the business of comedy. I sold glad. The thing with emotion, let's just talk about a popular buzzword for the last five years. Everybody is passionate. Oh, my God. Diane, you go on LinkedIn. Have you noticed this? Yeah. And, and I, I got to be honest, I didn't read through all of your credentials. Maybe you say you're passionate about helping business people become more passionate about their business. On LinkedIn, 
I saw a profile about a person that talked about how passionate they were about their job and their business. They sold like reflector tape. I'm like, are you going to pretend that you can get this, <laughs> this ev emotionally vested in reflector tape? So passion is almost uncontrollable. And the amount of proliferation of passion is almost uncontrollable. I wrote an article about this. I, I really have an issue with this. Wait a minute. you you know what? When two uh, lovers kill one another at a seedy motel on the bad side of town, they call it a crime of passion. Yes. So we're going we're going to use that same <laughs> level. We're use that same level of uh, emotion in running our business. So no, when emotion runs your business, it usually is bad for your business because you're not making clear headed decisions. I'm so with that. It's so true. It's it's really. I I thank you for for confirming that for me because. Um, I, I think one of the biggest problems with emotion is that it can cause people to not deal with things that they really need to deal with. And if they looked at it from a fact-based perspective, it would, you know, you always hear people say, um, I, I just don't like conflict. I just don't want to have those difficult right. conversations. Right. And, and I look at them and say, okay, well, the way that you don't do that is by setting the expectation at the beginning. You don't want to have them. Great. I don't either. Guess what? You're having them because you're not setting the expectation and then you're not holding the expectation. That's how those things go away. So, and that's just telling people what the facts are. This is what you can expect. This is what I expect. This is what you can expect. Yeah. I mean, I, I oh. was, I was guilty of, uh, you know, and I'm, I don't fear conflict. I'm from a large family of hot headed people. So conflict doesn't bother me so much in that regard, but it does get to where you can't just be always in conflict with your business. You know, you can't, if every day is a fight, it's like, man, are we in a boxing yeah. match here or am I trying to run my business? So you don't want that. But the worst thing is when you fear conflict, then you usually are making bad decisions also because you're being taken advantage of, or you're allowing an employee to, uh, you should fire, get, you should get rid of this person because they're not productive or they're hurting your business. So, uh, you know, at some point you've got to get over that. And also always realize that the stress of not addressing something is worse than the stress of addressing it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay. I have uh, one final question for you and it is, what is the best advice you were ever given? You know, that's a, that's going to be a tough one because over the years I've been told a lot of things that were bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've, I've been told a lot of things that were inaccuracies. Um, and this is, again, I guess I'm going to take that question, turn it on head. You asked me the best advice. I would say I've been, to, I've been given some terrible advice. Uh, you okay. know, that say things like when you worked in corporate America, said, you know, I'm not sure I was going to be, like, well, just bide your time, just bide your time. You know, just don't make any, don't make any waves, you know, maybe, you know, next thing you know, like what the hell kind of a recipe for life is that? Bide your time. Don't make waves. Just try and tough it out. If things aren't so bad, what kind of an underachiever would take that advice? Well, the person that was giving it was that underachiever. So there's some terrible advice that way. Then there's, of course, the terrible advice that you shouldn't try something. You shouldn't, you know, that is peril. You and I yeah. both talk to entrepreneurs. We are entrepreneurial minded folks. If we took advice from our accountants, our bankers, and our lawyers, no business would ever be started because all three of those professionals Absolutely. played games. Yep. Yep. So and, and I get it, that's their job. Sure, it's their job, but also they're they're not entrepreneurial minded people themselves. So I look at yeah. bad and terrible advice I've been given over the years. Best advice I've been given is probably uh, to, to continue reading and writing and learning. And I can't even say for sure who gave me that. And that's the advice I would pass on is continue to stay relevant. You know, if you said, hey, man, what's a piece of advice you would give to my business people? I would say continually, continually keep up by reading and paying attention to what you think uh, is going to happen. Because if you, if you just, if you just get lazy and don't pay attention that's when all of a sudden you're you look around it's like wow i'm kind of outdated you know you and i both are battling that you talk about relevance uh, you know you hit a certain age i'm gonna be 50 years old this week uh it dawns on me that i'm not the spring chicken that i was when i was 25 when i started out so i gotta work just a little bit harder at not getting too complacent not getting too comfortable 
because it's really the complacency that uh, that causes these folks to all of a sudden look around and oh, I got real comfortable. Now what? Well, now you're just yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. And you know, let me tell you, uh, from someone who who's far past. Uh, the 50 mark, the great thing about turning 50, of course, you're, you're already there. You were probably there when you were 20. You just don't care anymore. <laughs> great thing that happens the day you turn 50, you think, okay, that's it. I don't care. Makes life so much easier. Yeah, well, when, you're living, for, so when you're living for the, uh, the approval of others, you're going to have a hard time. And a lot of folks always wonder, if you've made a career on stage as a speaker like I do, they think, uh, you know, that you just have this need for accolades, that your ego is such that you have to have people come up and, and tell you you're brilliant. And I won't say I don't have an ego, but compared to many people that have uh, made a living getting up on stages and talking at corporate events, I don't have as much of that. I like the fulfillment of the completion. I like seeing yeah. things come to fruition. And that's the, the fun part for me. Best advice, I'll go back to another thing about advice. When people say, find something you love and, and do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's a bunch of crap. <laughs> you know, I, I love running my own business, but there's days I don't and there's activities I don't. I yeah. don't love the stress of trying to get through the Minneapolis airport in February when there's a blizzard on and then looking like I might end up sleeping on the floor for uh, the next day and a half there. How do you say you love that? I don't love certain aspects of what I do. And there's everybody listening to this podcast can admit there's things that they don't love about what they do. That's fine. But whoever told you do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, it's a bunch of crap because work is work. You can, right. You can judge that's it. That's why they don't call it play. Yeah. You know, you might say, hey, what Damien does, he writes books and gives speeches and, you know, has a farm. Well, that sounds like that'd be fun. Doesn't sound like it'd be that much work. Don't judge. Don't judge. Everything is work. It's just different in how you go about it. Right. Right. Exactly. That's right. Wow. This is so great. Thank you so much for um, spending some time with me and sharing this information. Will you um, share with the listeners how they can find you and the various ways they can get your book? Absolutely. DamianMason.com. D-A-M-I-A-N. Damien mason like a bricklayer.com is my name you can find my website davymason.com connect with me all over my social media from instagram to youtube to uh, twitter da at damien p mason to damien mason professional speaker on facebook uh you know i'm all over the place linkedin damien mason would love to hear from folks the book is called do business better traits habits and actions to help you succeed would love for your people to pick it up i promise you for the 16 or 18 dollars you're gonna pay for it it will give you a return on investment multiple, multiple, multiple times on that. Plus the time you devote to listening or reading it, uh, you'll get your payoff. Awesome. Thank you so much. And listeners, thank you. Uh, you are who we're doing this for. Uh, hope you were paying attention. And, you know, this is an episode you listen to more than once, in my opinion. I would also like to thank our sponsor. If you would like a free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook. Just go to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Full send with the driver? Check. Piercing iron through the wind? Check. Low checker, high spinner, flop to a tight pin? Check, check, and check. No matter what shot you need to pull off, there's one ball that's better for them all. The all-new TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. With a newly redesigned dimple pattern, engineered for more distance, more control around the green, and better stability in the wind, it's the hottest tour ball in golf. So no matter what shot you face, there's one ball that's better for all. The TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. The average person experiences up to 10,000 marketing efforts each day. Those ideas are called from millions of possibilities. The CMO Confidential Podcast takes you behind the scenes to learn about the decisions, drama, politics, and glory that go with one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite, the Chief Marketing Officer. Guests from all over the business world join Mike Linton, a five-time CMO, to share stories about what it's really like in the marketing universe.